Good morning and welcome to worship. It's a joy to have you here with us this morning. And uh, just a reminder to greet those folks who may be joining us online today, too. Good to have you in our midst as well this morning. Thanks for helping us to start this new uh, season of Epiphany together um, in good fashion. I know that we have uh, a number of our folks who are, are still out of town, certainly because of the way that the school breaks this year. So we understand that. Uh, we were actually out of town ourselves late last week and ran into members at the airport on Thursday morning when we headed out and ran into members at the airport last night when we got back in. So everybody seems to be uh, on the move at this point in time. But good to have you here. Let's uh, do what we can to savor the chance to gather in God's name. A couple things to note uh, before we, uh, we begin this morning. One of those is that Sunday school is back in session this morning for our preschoolers through fourth graders. It'll be taking place uh, starting at 1015 with some opening singing here in the sanctuary. Uh, so join Clay and Becky, the gang here, if you would. And we have a brand new adult forum series that's starting this morning at ten, same hour, 1015 in room one, um, talking about, uh, it's called Go Tell on the Mountain. It's focused on the ELCA mission activity. We are going to be uh, blessed to have it led and facilitated by some of our own uh, in-house missionaries, as it were, and that's Ron and Elsa Shart are going to be facilitating that for us this morning. So 1015, uh, grab a cup of coffee, grab a donut, whatever, join them in room one if you would. We'd love to have you be part of that um, as well. Um, speaking of donuts and refreshments, uh, we, it's one thing that we are still in need of helping hands with, uh, just helping to provide fellowship on Sunday mornings. Uh, it's the kind of thing that we kind of, kind of, easily kind of take for granted or assume, but we, it's, what, it's the kind of thing we'd love to have some more helping hands helping out with. So this clipboard is hanging back on the wall, across from the welcome station usually, but we'd love to see if we can get some more folks uh, on there this morning. I'm going to start it out. We'll pass it across the worship space this morning as we continue, if you don't mind, and that way you have a chance to sign up today, or if not, check your calendars, come back next week and do the same thing. We'll start it over here for us if we can, okay? Thanks much, Becky. Um, also, this week, uh, a little bit later on in the week, on Wednesday, we're going to be resuming our uh, Wednesday night, or win uh, X schedule with our young people, so our three youth groups meeting Wednesday night, come join them uh, on Wednesday if you have a part, or if you just like to be a part of their presence. They're a fun and encouraging group, to be sure. Um, our 2023 offering envelopes were, uh, were delayed this year getting here, but they finally arrived on Friday. They're not numbered, so if you use this as your means of giving, uh, just stack up them back on the welcome station by the offering plates. Feel free to grab, uh, uh, grab a set for yourself uh, on the way out of worship this morning. That would be great, too. We are going to be sharing our Lord's Supper today, as we might normally do. And if you are new to us, just a reminder that uh, we have uh, a gluten-free bread available and also wine and grape juice available for that distribution and certainly all are welcome so just a reminder about that um, as well with that i think we have covered the announcements so let's stand together and prepare for the greeting we're going to actually if my stand will loosen up there there we go Let's actually begin with our opening song, which is called Spirit of Gentleness. Go ahead, Paul.
poured into our hearts along with the saving grace of Jesus Christ and the abundant life of the Holy Spirit now be with you all. And also with you. We continue with our centering peace. God, our Father, at the baptism of Jesus, you proclaimed him, your beloved Son, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Make all who are baptized into Christ faithful to their calling to be your sons and daughters, and empower us all with your Spirit, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Alexis. We invite you to be seated and for our young folks to uh, come on up next for a chance to have a conversation with you. Come on up. We've got plenty of room for you. If, you are, uh, if you're ready to kind of get back in the groove here right after Christmas break and kind of gather with your friends and your neighbors and Sunday school and all those sort of times, we're going to see if we can have some fun together. We're going to actually start, instead of on the step this morning, we're going to start right up here. I invite you to take your hand for a second and dip it in here, if you don't mind. Dip it in here. It's not going to hurt you. Is it cold or is it warm? What's the matter, Jace? Is it cold? Is it cold? You think it's cold? What do you think? Go ahead. You can do it to me, too, if you want. I'm fair game. All right, there you go. Oh, I invited something. I'm a big now, and I? I got somebody who's got a real good... I think, I think, I think I'm suitably soaked. There you go. Okay. All right, the water's going to be all gone here pretty soon, right? We've got to have, make sure you save a little bit, I think, here, Jacob, so we have time for, for the sermon later on, okay? I want to ask you this. Whoop, careful, careful, you're going to get so wet. wet. Do you remember when you guys were baptized? Anybody remember your own baptism? Yep, you may, you may not, right? So why is that? Why don't you remember that? What do you think? Were you sleepy that day? No? We were you were a baby. That's exactly right. For many of us, not all of us, many of us, we were babies when we were baptized. And we don't remember what happened to us at this at all. And so the only time we might remember it is by looking back and seeing pictures of it maybe later on, or maybe a video of it or something like that, right? We might remember it that way, but that'd be about it. So I want to ask you this. You know who does remember your baptism? 
Me? Yeah, in many cases it's me. Your parents, that's right. And God remembers your baptism, right? Because God was part of it. You know that? Because in baptism, God made you a special promise. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized? I wasn't quite around then either. Right? We've heard that story, though, in the Bible. We hear a story we're going to hear this morning about Jesus himself being baptized. And when he was baptized, he was baptized by his cousin John. And John baptized things a little bit differently than, than Jesus did. When he baptized people, he baptized them for the sake of preparing them for Jesus. And so he used to say, when he would call them to the river and the water, he would say really loud, repent. You try that together. Repent. All right. You know what that means? That means turn around. It means turn around. So do I have two volunteers? Two volunteers? Any volunteers this morning? It's really simple. So would you be my volunteer this morning? Colin, would you be my volunteer this morning? Okay. I'd like you guys to turn right here. I'd like you to start walking down the aisle over here, right down right now, and I'm going to have you go until I say repent, and then you can turn around, okay? Go right, follow her right this way if you could, Colin. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Repent! Come on back over. Come on back up, right? You got the idea, right? That's exactly what that meant. But when we were baptized, right, we have a little bit different meaning in our baptism, right? Our meaning says that we were chosen by God as God's special people, special children. And God wants all of us, every one of us, to be part of that. He doesn't want anybody left out. You know that? But when he made that promise to you, he said, you are my child. And I'm going to make that promise sealed right in you, right here, right now on your forehead. And I'm going to let you know and remind you that I don't just love people in general. I love Trig, and I love Jace, and I love Dylan, right? Because he says, everyone, everyone's going to be part of my family. Pretty cool, huh? Pretty cool. Well, thanks for playing with me today. We're going to remember our Jesus baptism. We'll see if we can remember that story right now as we go back to our seats, okay? Awesome. Thanks for coming up. Do we have a towels available? Our lesson today is from Matthew 3, 13 through 17. <clears throat> Jesus then appeared, arriving at the Jordan River from Galilee. He wanted John to baptize him. John objected, I'm the one who needs to be baptized, not you. But Jesus insisted, do it. God's work, putting things right all these centuries, is coming together right now in this baptism. So John did it. The moment that Jesus came up out of the baptismal waters, the skies opened and he saw God's spirit. It looked like a, lo a dove descending and landing on him and along with the spirit, a voice. This is my son chosen and marked by my love, delight of my life. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Thanks, Glenda. Watch your step on the way back just in case. All right? When Steve signed up to usher today, little did he know that uh, he had some extra duty this morning. But uh, thanks uh, for our young people to help us remember uh, what it is that we are marking today. We are... Um, we're starting this, this new year together with actually a fresh new sermon series today, and this time around focused around the basics of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And we're calling it bread and butter discipleship, just uh, because that really is what it's about, the, the foundations, the basic elements of that in their most essential forms. And I hope that, that you'll come to maybe appreciate what that, what that means and what that represents as we go through um, these next few weeks together. But we're going to start right here at the font where the kids started this morning and ask you what your own first thoughts are as you saw them splashing around in that baptismal pool today. What your first thoughts were as you hear that liquid 
dripping, right, out of the font. And because we no sooner stand in the wake of the Christmas story, just a couple of weeks back now, when year after year, most of the four gospel accounts send us right here to the story of Jesus' own baptism in the River Jordan. It's a retelling that, that we share at the beginning of almost every year uh, together as we come together as people of God. And what happens in that story? Well, but they just told it. But depending on the particular version of it, John the, baptism, John the Baptist is out in the middle of nowhere kind of shouting about this need to, to repent, to turn around, to come back, to be cleansed of their sin, as was his custom, apparently, when who shows up but his cousin Jesus. And John doesn't want to, to steal the limelight from Jesus or the, the one he sometimes calls the Lamb of God, and so he's hesitant when Jesus comes down to present himself to be baptized. And as that account proceeds, however, that's exactly what happens. Jesus is dunked, the heavens part, a dove descends, and this big voice booms an up pronouncement, this is my son. It's pretty hard to miss. And one that you think would, would call the, for folks to, just to stop and celebrate and commemorate the moment right then and there, that's not quite what happens because the, before the water is even dried on Jesus' forehead, he is either thrown or led further out into the woods or the wilderness for a grueling 40-day adventure. There you have it in a nutshell. Right? That's the account. And yet while that story might be familiar to most of us and some of us at least, the questions I think that come out of it, the implications of that, remain many and sometimes really kind of awkward because we have to ask the question, for instance, right, why was Jesus, in fact, baptized? If you follow John's logic, John's thinking, why was it necessary? What was its purpose? Because for John, as I said, this sacred rite and ritual was reserved for and intended for repentance for all the things you'd done wrong. But if Jesus was, in fact, sinless, as the church has long since taught, then it doesn't seem to be the least bit necessary, does it, in his case? And yet, Jesus, we're told, insisted upon it. He said it had to be. And why would that be the case? Well, perhaps, again, I, you might be asked, scratching your head and asking that question, and you wouldn't be alone because I can just about imagine the befuddled expression on John's face for the rest of that day at the river where he continues to, to baptize others. He still had to be wondering why in the world his cousin had shown up there. And it wouldn't be that much different, I suppose, than his continued puzzlement long afterward as he heard about Jesus' three years of subsequent ministry. And there, too, he had just kind of been expecting a little something different, right? He'd been expecting a kind of Dwayne Johnson strongman, but Jesus was acting a little more like Mr. Rogers. So John is really confused, both at the beginning right, of Jesus' ministry, and for that matter, he isn't much clearer as it goes along. So again, what's the purpose of this ritual in Jesus' case? And what, pray tell, is the connection, right, between Jesus' own baptism and the baptism that you and I often practice with, with our own sons and daughters, with our own new disciples in our midst? What, pray tell, and how are they connected? Well, the church has again, oftentimes thought and taught that it appears to have something to do with confirming or affirming one's own primary identity, both in Jesus' case and in our own, right? Claiming us, announcing us first and foremost as sons and daughters of God. And there are really good reasons to, to be able to, to embrace that idea. It's a whole sermon on its own. And yet it seems as though oftentimes at least in our own day and age, and oftentimes at least in my own experience, sometimes we, we tend to regard this baptism business as kind of a, a very individualistic and kind of private affair, you know what I mean? It's like we're baptized into the, the family, as it were, but the family sometimes doesn't go beyond our own nuclear family. And so it's a, a sacred ritual yet, but one that 
that maybe doesn't go beyond that piece of it. So this morning, I'd like to suggest that the meaning of this ritual, both for Jesus and for us, is maybe something quite beyond that. And I'd like us to, to ponder whether the point of the story here is revealed not just by the dove descending or by the voice declaring God's connection here to Jesus. Because I can't help but wonder if it also doesn't have something to do, well, too, with what comes immediately after this. It's a part that we, we don't oftentimes share in our worship in this season. As a matter of fact, we wait quite a few weeks until we get to the season of Lent until we talk about this part. The part that really happens right after this, when Jesus is drawn to the desert, the wilderness, in biblical terms, where he is tempted and yet tended by the angel, according to the Gospels. It may not be clear at the moment, but perhaps I think a key point of the story then is that a primary reason Jesus insisted on being baptized that day was to fully identify with us. Right? He wanted us to know that he was not setting himself one step above us whatsoever. He wanted us to recognize that he too was fully human. He identified with us fully in that sense in our own brokenness that day entered into the same waters that he, in fact, wanted us to enter into. He wanted to walk, assure that he, he knew that we knew that he walked in our shoes. And to take that one step further, then I think he also wanted us to recognize that we, like he, were called to be part of a wider community. This wasn't just a me and Jesus event. It's to be part of an introduction to a wider community of disciples who get to follow alongside us, who get to practice this with us. And if that's true of, of Jesus' baptism, then our own baptism is also a call to live in community. And, I think, to work together in the wilderness of the world. In other words, by association, it seems that being in wilderness together isn't just a, an afterthought. It's not just something that comes weeks after. It's an inherent part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. An inherent part of what it means for us together to be the people of God. All right? So that's part of the idea. So let's go back to Jesus for a second. You know, he may very well have had a greater awareness of his own identity as God's beloved son after this, this moment by the river, this moment of his own baptism. Right? But that doesn't imply that he has special treatment from God for a second. Instead, what happens? Again, he's thrown out into this wild and woolly world. A place that's full of danger, that's full of temptation, that's, that's full of all kinds of, of issues and troubles and awkwardness and messiness. Because face it, whether you're divine or not, when you're in it, you're in it. <laughs> you can feel it. And you can experience it. Right? And I can't help but, 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 but admit how often I focused on Jesus doing this and, and doing this being alone in that experience. You know, it's just, it's part of the story as, as we're told, but it's also part of our own stereotypes. That how he had to somehow summon up this sort of superhuman strength and resolve in order to resist all of these savory temptations that, that take place out in that wilderness. You can check out the next chapter, Matthew 4, for what that looked like for him. But in the process, it seems like he also then sometimes subtly kind of to buy into this, this notion that he's kind of a lone ranger, right? And this is just a, a totally a solo mission. This is all about uh, summoning up his own individual strength and stamina and resolve. And I'll admit that that sometimes can be the way we look at it. Or I can also admit that that may in fact be exactly what this story is in fact trying to teach. But the history of epiphanies or these kind of aha moments in general when you look at the bible as a whole suggests that they are they are really seldom a matter of being just a, a private revelation that's not really the point behind it they aren't shared for just one person to experience or to move on or to use they aren't shared for just one purpose matthew in particular suggests that they are usually communal in nature 
usually given to more than one, including here at Jesus' baptism, right? Because what does the voice from heaven say here in Matthew? It says, this is my beloved son. Not you are my beloved son. This is it. In other words, everybody was in on the secret. Everybody got to hear it, not just Jesus. And so then when he was ultimately led into the wilderness, he knows that this is not just a a private affair. This is not just a a personal test, not just a lone examination. It's something that he understands that we get to share too. It's an introduction to a group exercise, as it were, right? And so when, when Jesus, again, is drawn into that wilderness, we can say, aha, that's where we're called to follow him too. And so to summarize just a little bit, then, we too are reminded here that with baptism comes wilderness. That neither baptism nor wilderness are individual affairs. They are part of a community experience almost by definition. And if you go back centuries before Jesus, you see it lived out. The Israelites may have, in fact, been in the wilderness, but they weren't there by themselves, right? God had promised God was going to walk with them through the whole process. They had each other, too. And the prophets might have sometimes felt alone, but they themselves came out of prophetic traditions that that were surrounded by other such visionaries. And if nothing else, they were part of a long tradition of their, their own predecessors. And Jesus was in that wilderness, but not alone, too. He had the spirit that was given to him in this baptism. He had the promise of God's declaration and protection. He had, later on, the angels tending to him as well. And so, likewise, again, when you and I feel like we are in the middle of our own wilderness, our own desert, our own awkward, messy experience, we are never there alone. Our baptism propels us into a community to get to share it with us. And whenever we rely on baptism as that which only gets treated like that, it's kind of safeguarding our own individual security or salvation, it's all about me and Jesus, then I think we, we sometimes really miss the point, both of Matthew's story as he tells it and for that matter of the sacrament itself. Allow me to use maybe the example of my late friend, Don, to spell that out a little bit. In my experience, Don was one who was, who was known over and over again to get teary-eyed when he stopped and pondered the fact that he had been baptized. He'd get teary-eyed when he, when he stopped and thought about what that meant, that God would actually grant the likes of him Right? assurance of his future, promise of his own salvation, despite of all the ways he had dropped the ball and failed God, failed his family. And to remember that event was a, a really emotional experience then for Don. But it never meant that he simply kicked back and, and then rested on his laurels, even though his trust in that promise right, was, was about as rock solid as anybody I'd ever experienced or met. Instead, he, he recognized that that privilege, that promise that had been given him, weren't just for his own sake. It wasn't just about something that he got to, to be thankful for and then go on his own way. But it meant that, that that was a promise and privilege lived in partnership, shared for the sake of a much broader audience and a much mi- wider world. And so in his case, whether it was serving in church in multiple roles or being a loaned executive for United Way, whether it was working with Rotary or simply just caring for his own aging mother, his own vulnerable grandchildren, his attempt to follow Jesus led him into plenty of wilderness. And yet, I don't believe that Don would have it any other way, right? Because he knew that connection of his identity wasn't just personal, it was communal. And it led him out to share that with the world. And I witness the same kind of reality regularly here at Holy Trinity. And the stories, the images, just the witness that so many of you are, are able to share. Where despite the privilege of being claimed by, as a child of God ourselves, that recognition right, of, of wilderness and that being the place we're called to serve is, is assumed. Sometimes it's, it's Larry and his tireless willingness to reform the criminal justice system, just working in prison after prison long after his own retirement. He wouldn't have to do that. 
but he does. Sometimes it's, it's Heidi or Noel or Larry or Jake or other folks who are working as counselors, wading regularly into the awkward spaces in people's lives where no simple answers might live, but they feel called to serve and go and walk beside. Maybe it's the willingness of our own high school youth who wear those green bandanas and signal to somebody who's struggling that they are never alone. They don't have to go it on their own. Maybe it's evident that those who provide meals or quilts are just listening ears and oh, so many varieties, things that I know about, things that I'll never know about. Right? All of those are ways in which we too are called into wilderness. All of those are ways in which we live out this promise given to us in this water that was just given to Jesus. So this series on the fundamental elements of discipleship are asking us, you know, what Jesus is asking of us as the body of Christ at work in the world. And I hope and I, I pray that, again, over the next few weeks, maybe all of us just get to wrestle with that afresh a bit. And perhaps we can honor that much more, that much more fully, the calling that is yours, mine, ours, together through the baptism we share with Jesus. It's one that comes, Lord knows, with plenty of wilderness. In his name, amen. In that spirit, we're going to join in singing our hymn of the day, one that um, we oftentimes sing during the Lenten season, but I think fits with this emphasis and theme this morning. It's called Out in the Wilderness. as you're able as we join in the prayers of the church.
And as we come together this morning as God's people to share this journey together, let's gather and offer up our prayers for the church, for all those we know to be in special need today, and for those we know to be part of, of God's good creation. Calling God, we give thanks for the call to engage and engage together in ministry, a call we share with both Jesus and with one another. We ask that you'd speak with power to your church today, that you'd open our hearts, our minds to the new things that you may be declaring in our midst, and that you'd strengthen ministry teams, visioning councils, prayer circles, small groups, each to be equipped for your reconciling and your redeeming work, empowering God. Grant us your grace to respond in love. In renewing God, you provide the waters of the earth, and in Jesus' baptism, you reveal the waters of life. And so cleanse and protect oceans again today, rivers and watersheds, and bring relief to parched lands, to communities without access to safe water. Help all of us to be committed, committed to protecting what is indeed precious and limited. Empowering God, grant us your grace to respond in love. Righteous God, you never weary of establishing justice, and so we ask you to increase cooperation and constructive dialogue and healing work between nations and peoples. We pray especially for the tensions between Russia and Ukraine, Israel and Palestinians, and that you guide local and national and international authorities to govern with equity and with vision and with integrity. We pray for those who are in military service, those who are peacemakers, and yes, for all who have even declared themselves to be our enemies. Empowering God, grant us your grace to respond in love. And abiding God, in your mercy is ever steadfast. And so we ask that you give real sanctuary to people who are fleeing oppression or poverty or famine, sustained health care workers or caregivers or first responders, counselors, immigration authorities, all who, who help and to heal, whatever that capacity may be. Comfort those who are grieving or experiencing crisis today. We especially think of the people in Buffalo who are still grieving those lost to recent storms there. Empowering God, grant us your grace to respond in love. And blessing God. In Christ, you gather your beloved community, and we pray for those who may not be gathered with us today, for all who are ailing, perhaps in mind or in body or spirit. Help us to be sensitive to their respective plights and reach out to them in love in ways when it's safe to do so. We'll speed the recovery of those able to, to, do, to, uh, to, to be able to, to look forward to the healing that they're undergoing, whether it's, it's John and his recent transplant, Ed and Ron. Comfort those in hospice care, including Mary Lou and Dale and all in their dying days. And grant hope to all concerned. We pray too for Harold and, and for Judy, for Glenn and Sylvia, for Ed and Dorothy, all those we name before you in our hearts today, God. And so once again, empowering God, grant us your grace to respond in love. And then finally, just for each of the many petitions that we perhaps are only so bold to speak in our hearts today. Empowering God, grant us your grace to respond in love. So we bring to you our needs and our hopes, O oh God, trusting your wisdom and your power revealed in Christ crucified. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's now take a moment to share both a sign and a peace, sign of God's peace, peace with peace. one another. Peace. peace. And we invite you next to be seated as our gifts are shared and we prepare our hearts to celebrate this meal of hope that Christ has set before us.
as we offer up our gifts today, as those gifts are presented, let's together pray. Receive these gifts we bring, God of grace, ourselves, our time, and the things we manage. Open up the heavens to us as we do your work of mercy, as we long for your peace, and as we hunger and thirst for Jesus Christ. Amen. Once again, as we approach God, let's stand together and come in confession, trusting, once again, the love of the crucified Christ. Holy God, with what shall we come before you? We have too often turned from your way to follow our own. Forgive us for the times we have spoken or acted too quickly, or we have not spoken or acted at all. Forgive us for when we have hurt those closest to us or hurt those we have yet to know. Give us grace when we have thought more about ourselves than others and when we have thought less of ourselves than we ought. Turn us around and give us a fresh start today that we might be reconciled to you and to one another. Amen. Scripture reminds us over and over that even when we have done wrong, God makes us right. That even when we have messed it up, God puts us back together. And so receive, once again, the promise of your baptism. That you are God's child. Your sins are indeed forgiven. Amen. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts, then. And let us once again offer up our thanks and praise to God. It is right to give God our thanks and praise. Once again, in the night in which our Lord Jesus was himself betrayed, we recall that he took bread, he broke it, he gave thanks, and he gave it to those first disciples saying, Take and eat, this is my body which is now given up for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, once again, he took the cup. When he'd given thanks once again, he'd give to David too for all to share. And he said, take and drink, each of you, because this cup is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood, blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this too, then, for the remembrance of me. And so it is that we pray once more as Jesus first taught those first disciples. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And save us from the time of trial. Deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Come to the table of mercy and of peace. We invite you to be seated.
Now, having once again tasted these gifts of God, let's stand together as you're able and receive the blessing. As John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Renew our strength, Lord, to do justice, love kindness, and to journey humbly with you. Amen. I invite you to remain standing as we sing our ascending hymn. It's a piece called Open Up the Heavens. Lord, together. <laughs> Show us, show us your power. Show 
thanks again for joining us for worship this morning. Stick around for refreshments, for Sunday school, for adult forum, and uh, again, all the things that God has blessed to share with us today. Meanwhile, go in peace to love, live, and share Christ. Thanks be to God.